Hello, my name is Carl Kutzmode, and I lead the talent consulting practice for our firm Talent Rise. We're an executive search and talent consulting firm based in Chicago. Today, I'll be interviewing Jay Pryor, the Chief Diversity Officer at Sugar Inc. Um, Jay is a highly sought after speaker, executive coach, and facilitator of corporate trainings and workshops globally. Jay identifies as they, and they are a transgender and gender nonconforming advocate and educator for inclusivity and gender consciousness. Jay is also the author of the acclaimed book, Lean Inside, Seven Steps to Personal Power, a Practical Guide to Transformation for Women. My goal in the next 20 to 30 minutes is to really open up a discussion around a rather sensitive conversation that's happening in the workplace today. And hopefully we'll get some answers to the questions many HR leaders and their employees would you know, want to ask regarding um, the why behind the day and the evolution of gender non-conforming culture in the workplace. So that said, I'd like to get our conversation kicked off. And uh, Jay, I'd like to just kind of have you share a little bit about your personal journey and what inspired you to, you know, do the work that you do today, which is so much needed. Thank you. First of all, Carl, just thanks for having me and thanks for being willing to dive into this uh, conversation. It's not always comfortable for people. So um, the fact that you're willing to take this on um, just is important to me and important to the world right now. So thank you for that and giving me this opportunity to be here. Um, I uh, was assigned female at birth. I was born way back in the day in 1966. Um, and uh, they looked at my genitals and they called me Janet and said it's a girl. And uh, I, you know, things were fine for a long time. I was a tomboy. And, um, you know, I was out there playing football and wrestling and fighting and doing all the things in a small town in Kansas that we do. I never wore a shirt or shoes. <laughs> like I just, um, I had a blast and uh, until about sixth grade. And in sixth grade, my experience was that all my friends came back as different people. They came back like aliens to sixth grade. Before the summer before, they had their shirts off and were playing football with me. And then all of a sudden they came to school and they were carrying purses and wearing makeup and all of them were talking about boys all the time. And when do you when you start your period? Because that's when you become a woman. And all this whole conversation that for me felt completely alien. Like it was like, what happened? <laughs> what wow. happened? We weren't having this conversation before. So to add insult to injury, at that time, that year, my sixth grade, my mom decided it was time for me to get a training bra because apparently these things need to be trained. And <laughs> um, I find myself standing in J.C. Penney, spread eagle, getting a bra strapped around me. And I was mortified. I was humiliated. I felt so stupid and I didn't know what was going on. It just felt completely clueless to me. And it really started a conversation for me at that moment or at that time that something was wrong with me. Mm. And that clearly something was wrong with me because I wasn't like any of the other kids around me. There was nobody that was on TV. There was nobody in my world that was like me. There was clearly something wrong with me. So a long story short, when I was 14 years old, 13 or 14, um, I kissed a girl, had that experience, and I was a girl. So that was also, in one moment, it was liberating because I had this oh that's what's <laughs> wrong with me right it was like oh i'm gay and literally the next breath carl was like i'm gay like i can't be gay <laughs> that is not going to work here right yeah. i'm in a small town of 500 people all white all christian and my dad's the mayor this is not going to work here <laughs> so uh, <laughs> unfortunately that sent me on a really pretty intense uh suicidal ideation and uh, a lot of excessive alcohol abuse um my junior year of high school, I drove my parents' car 100 miles an hour down a country road, and I flipped it with an intention to kill myself. Um, two years of suicidal ideation later, I landed myself in a psychiatric unit. It was uh, 1984 and uh, coming on 85, actually was just turning 85. And, uh, you know, I'm in that psychiatric unit with all these people dealing with mental health, and I'm there hating my guts because I'm gay. So for me, the most important thing that happened at that psychiatric unit was uh, I met my first butch lesbian. She mm -hmm. was there to visit her uh, partner. And I remember the moment she stepped off the, off the elevator. I was up getting my meds and I heard this ding. 
And I turned around and it was like Fonzie stepped off the elevator. I mean, it was, <laughs> like, oh, it was, it was a, amazing. This woman stepped off the elevator. She had black jeans on and a white t-shirt and a motorcycle helmet. And I mean, I was just like, what? You know, and I just, I followed her. <laughs> she walked down the hall and I followed her and introduced myself. And um, she and her partner were the first people that ever said to me, there's nothing wrong with you. You're just gay. Yeah. And for me, that was a game changer because I, in my world, I was a sexual deviant. I was going to hell. The, out of all these things that were definitely wrong with me. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that was when I came out in 1985. And uh, part of my care plan was that I wasn't allowed to move back to my small town uh, because there was nobody out there and it was kind of scary. And so I came out as a young butch and being butch felt so good to me. And I, and I came to my, this town in Lawrence, Kansas, and I walked into this bookstore. And the first thing somebody said to me was, Hey, who's the new baby Butch? And I was home. It was like for the first time in my life, I belong. They see you finally. Somebody sees you. Yeah, (laughs) someone sees me for the first time in my life, right? So I was, you know, living large. I mean, there weren't very many of us, but we'd get together. You know, I just I was I was out and I was happy and and um, I got the nickname Jay because I was pretty Butch and I didn't look like a Janet. (laughs) So I got people started calling me Jay and I loved that. Right. And one yeah. day this this femme that I thought was just so beautiful wrote me a note and she wrote out J A Y. I was like, that's my name. You know, it was just like that feels so good to me, right? And so um then in nineteen ninety, uh my dad got really sick and um he was clearly on his way out. And I had a conversation with him and um asked him if I uh you know, I felt like he was gonna die. And he said, I'm worried about you. And I said, Why? <laughs> and he said, Financially, you're going to be on your own. I was only 23 years old and uh, I'm the youngest of nine kids. So he had taken care of all nine of us up to that point, And he was concerned wow. about me. And I said, I can handle it. And he said, then just get your education. I just want you to get your education. So I promised my dad on his death that I'd get my education. And when I went back to school, I'd never met anybody butch who'd had higher education in their lives. So they were all blue collar workers. Yeah. So I thought I had to fem up, right? So I grew my hair out. I got some tips from my sister on makeup. I donned a power suit and I changed my name back to Janet or started going back to Janet and went to college. And it was in college that I got into activism and learning that by sharing my story as a suicidal youth, I could make a difference for other youth. Right. The people that were dealing with this, that I could I could actually make a difference. And that's when I started having this passion for not having, excuse me, not having a youth have to go through what I went through, right? Like right. if I could make it, if I could make that difference just by sharing my story and being out. So I did that all through college and towards the end of college, um, to make a long story short, I went to a conference and met a woman there who um, basically asked me like, why would you grow your hair out more and makeup? What do you, you know, that's not who you are. Mm-hmm. And I said, well, I thought I had to. I mean, even at the time, Katie Lang, you know, never went anywhere without her puff you know, shoulder sleeves and her eyeliner, you know, you're like, and I'm sure you should not wearing that at home, you know, exactly. so it felt like you kind of had to do that to, to be okay in society, right? Yeah. And this woman just said to me, it's not who you are. And she sent me a book called Stone Butch Blues, which uh-huh. is a beautiful book if you haven't read it. It's And it's free uh, when the author, Leslie Feinberg, uh, died, their partner, uh, Mini Bruce Pratt made it available for free as a PDF. So bottom line, though, I read that book and I realized that once again, I wasn't being authentic with myself and that I also realized I'm not the only one out there. <laughs> I was yeah. like, oh, once again, I'm home. Like I see these, I'm seen. Right. And yeah. so that's when I say I started my transition. I threw out all my girl clothes and I, you know, just the only girl clothes I owned was a frog bra that kept my breasts really bound tight because we didn't have binders back then in 1998. And so um, that's when I started my transition, when I started my transition, and I swore I wasn't going to ever take testosterone or go ahead and transition because for me, I was very woman identified and I didn't want to be a man. I was always felt like I was kind of either or or neither. And um, so in 2001, I took testosterone. And if you don't know this, that when a female bodied human takes testosterone, it completely shifts their body fat It completely everything turns male like, oh, yeah, I mean, I had a thick 
beard and like hair all over me. And I mean, I was very, very, very butch, <laughs> very masculine. <laughs> and I thought that I could be out as a genderqueer, a trans person. But the reality is I was full on male and that's what people saw and that's what they related to, which is part of why I uh, do a lot of coaching exclusively for women, because I also got to see the difference in how I was treated as a butch dyke versus a white man um it was night and day like how i the respect i got the yes sirs i got the always the serving <laughs> all of that was mind-blowing to me i was just like whoa um so you know i lived uh what i call as an undercover white guy for 18 years and after 18 years of being uh that entitled and having that much privilege it kind of seeks starts to seep into you. And I felt like I was starting to become the thing that I never wanted to be in the first place. And then the, the Me Too movement happened with uh, in 2017. And that reminded me that I was very woman identified at some point. And so I went off testosterone in 2018. Uh -huh. I have my full female body back now, except for my beard and my hairline. Otherwise, everything is female. Everyone sees what they see, so they see me as male. But the reality is I am both. I mean, I, I, you know, like I've got a beard and I have a woman's body under here minus breath. So, I mean, you know, like I, I'm, I'm literally both or literally neither or, you know, one of those, which is my long, sorry, explanation for the why, right? Because I want people to understand there's people like me who exist that, you can't put me in a pink box or a blue box. I just don't fit in there. And so I'm something in between or I'm neither. <laughs> and so yeah. when the, the I have always identified and the words I used were genderqueer, but that word didn't even exist at all in the world, except for in the very small section of the LGBTQIA community, <laughs> right? Sure. Or the, excuse me, the 2S LGBTQI community. Like that word just didn't exist. So people just took me as a man. And yeah. um, that's not what I want. That's not who I am. And so when they then pronouns started to come out, I was just as resistant as anybody, you know, what you resist per se. I was pushing against it because of the grammar and because of all of that, right? I'm, I'm just turned 55. I mean, you know, it just sounded weird. <laughs> I was like, that's weird. But one day I was speaking, and it's interesting that I happened to be speaking down around my hometown because I used to take transgender conferences to small towns in Kansas to try to, again, educate and help trans kids. And um, I'm speaking one day and I'm talking about how I don't fit in the pink box, I don't fit in the blue box. And I stepped off the platform and I was like, I gotta start using they them pronouns. Like, I gotta come out one more time as a non-binary person that I've always been. I just need to say it out loud and start using the pronouns. and. The more I do and the more that people use them with me, it's like makes my heart sing. You know, it's like a it's like it feels good <laughs> sure. to me. So that's the why behind the day and a little bit of my a lot of it of my story. Um, but and I and I apologize for the length, but it's like I'm old, so I've lived a long time. <laughs> no, and and, I, <laughs> and I wanted that... people to hear that that I've walked through the world as a woman for 35 years before I walked through the world as a man for 18 years. So I have this unique perspective of having been absorbed by the world as first a butch woman and then as a uh, what perceived as a white straight man um and it's a totally different world but i have this amazing perspective because i've gotten to live it all sure. and that's part of why i'm a they so you know that that kind of begs the question then are all people who identified as transgender identifying themselves as they for the same reasons no 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 not at all um, a lot of my friends who transitioned with me at the time I transitioned or started taking testosterone, they're still on testosterone and they, in their minds, many of them, and I have a trans son who feels this way, feels like they were born in the wrong body. Like he okay. was a boy and he still identifies as a, he, identif he was assigned female at birth, but he identifies as male. Um, and that's his gender identity. So people's gender identity and their gender expression are very different. So my son has gender identity of male, even though he's assigned a female at birth. 
his gender expression is very fluid. So sometimes he wears dresses, sometimes he wears boy clothes, depends on how he feels during the day. The younger mm -hmm. generation is way more fluid with their expression. Absolutely. Gender identity is very specific and I, my gender identity is non-binary, but a trans man's gender identity is man, right? And yeah. a trans woman's gender identity is woman. So there's some of us that identify as non-binary, we use they, them pronouns. We're the ones in between, we're the ones that don't feel like we wanna be put in a box. And then there's people who are like, oh, I want to be in that box. <laughs> Even though I was right. born in this box, I want to be in that box. And, you know, one of the things I do is I have a show called The Gender Reveal Party. And in that show, one of the things I tease about, because it's a comedy, is that the gender reveal parties that people are having are actually genital reveal parties. Um, and it's, you know, kind of weird that people get dressed up to have an unborn baby's genitals revealed to them. But <laughs> that's yeah. what's happening. And that doesn't have anything to do with gender, right? So genitals and gender are not the same thing. And so that's what's important for people to get. And yeah. if you really think about it, what kind of freedom could even like cisgender and cis means same. So if you see, so you, I'm going to guess like identifying your brain as a man and your yep. genitals match. So you're a cisgender man, right? So even for cisgender people, like what could be possible if we stopped, per, stopped, this weird idea that your gender is dictated by your genitals like that you because you have the male genitalia then that means you should take out trash <laughs> like, <laughs> it's just the silliest thing i've ever heard <laughs> but right, that's, it's how that's we what society does that's what we do and that's pink is a color does. but we act like it's a thing you know it's just so silly so you know my goal is to try to free everybody up <laughs> around their gender expression because what, what could be possible for us if we can do that? Well, and, and this really kind of puts things in perspective, you know, when you frame it in that way that it, your genital identity is not your gender identity. Absolutely. So I think yeah. that is where people get hung up. 100%. You know, and and you know, in the in the wake of you know George Floyd and everything that's gone on, employers have put an emphasis on their DEI programs yeah. um, to to make should. sure that yeah, like they're doing you know what they're trying to do the right thing. Absolutely. But they're you know they're asking these questions and they're getting these questions from their employees and you know so it it's this is really helpful. Um, I hope so. You know to help them understand you know what they need to do so when you think about like their programming from a, a dei programming perspective is there anything you recommend an hr leader to do uh, differently than maybe what the standard programming is out there to make sure that people who identified as they are included and not just bucketed into lgbtq you know yeah Absolutely. First of all, there's just resources. Um, my good friend Rhodes Perry uh, has a book called Belonging in the Workplace, and it's brilliant. I recommend every HR director read that. Um, but also, you know, part of it is incorporating the they them pronouns until it's normal. <laughs> so but what that takes is changing a neural pattern. So mm. if you think about the, the any trying anything new, when you start anything new, it's awkward, right? It feels yes. weird, but not any weirder than when you pick up a new musical instrument and try to play it. Have you ever tried to pick up a clarinet and play it? I mean, you're <laughs> terrible at it. You sound horrible, right? I mean, you and you have to be willing to make mistakes and to be bad at it. And you know, you can't get good at anything if you're just gonna say, well, I quit. Right? right. And I have people do that. They'll say, Jay, I just can't get these. I just can't call you. I just got to I got to use you. You know, and I'm like, well, you're not then you're if you're not willing <laughs> right. right, to push through the uncomfortableness, then you can't do it. So one of the things that HR directors can do is they can start that they them conversation and have their employees practice um, using they them pronouns. Obviously, you know, you want to bring in some training. We can do that, but you can do this on your own where you can have people start to practice, you can have it become a conversation that people are committed to and uh, have it be part of the value that we, we include everyone and we want everyone to feel like they belong. There's a big difference between inclusion and belonging. You can include yes. me, but that doesn't mean I feel like I belong. Exactly. And so the other thing is to like for the whole company to start ungendering language all around the way, right? So mm -hmm. to give up 
ladies and gentlemen, you know, when I sit in here and speaker say, ladies and gentlemen, first thing I think of is, where am I going? Who are you talking? Am I talking? Are you talking to me? <laughs> right. I'm in the room. And so, you know, and I, like I say, I'm 55 years old and I've been through a lot of stuff right, to come out. But these younger kids that are coming out and coming into the workforce who are brilliant and creative and you want them to work for you. Right. They're not willing to be uh, feel uncomfortable at work. And so they will find other things to do or they'll find places to work who actually will do this. Sure. So I really think that um, companies are going to see a need for this conversation to be included as part of any kind of, you know, personal development, press, professional development work they do with their staff. It's just got to be included in there. Well, and, and you brought up some good points about the younger generation coming into the workplace and their expectations. Um, and, and that kind of is some of the other side of the coin is in an employer's efforts to be inclusive and to, you know, do the right thing. The employees that are working with people who identify as they are, are have a fear or uncomfortableness around someone, you know, like saying or doing the wrong thing. And so instead of being inclusive and doing what they are told they should do by HR or by the programs, they ignore that person or don't include them in social events outside of work or don't include their perspective because they're afraid they're going to slip up and call them the wrong gender. They're going right. to afraid they're going to offend them. Right. And so that fear creates the opposite of inclusive. And, right. and we hear this when I'm talking with with people that it's like I rather than be, you know, offend somebody I'd rather just not do it you know or right. not involve them right yeah and so I mean there has to at some point become a willingness again to push through that uncomfortableness but one of the things that so I want to give you a couple of thoughts to, to tell you how important this is what we know statistically is for a transgender youth or a non-binary youth by calling them the right pronoun or using the right name with them you decrease suicidal ideation by 50 percent Wow. So you are you are 50 percent more likely to see that kid alive if you just affirm them. And who doesn't want to be affirmed? Right. Yeah. I mean, don't all of us just, you know, this is our name. You don't want to get somebody's name wrong. So it's like what what you're doing is a limit is giving this person an opportunity to be alive and thrive in your culture as opposed to hiding, leaving, going somewhere else. Now, I know it can be uncomfortable for folks. But if you can push through and just act like it's not, I mean, one of the things that's important to us is that we, you not make a big deal out of it, right? right. So if you misgender me or you misname me, preferably the, the misgendering is a little bit less than dead naming. So that's called dead naming. If you were to call me Janet, that would be calling me by my dead name. Um, that's a little more intense than just missing my, uh, my gender. Cause I know that I look male. So that's, you know, it's like hard sometimes for people to see male and switch right. that up. Sure. Um, but if you can just say, gosh, I'm sorry, I'll keep working on that, you know, and just move on. You know I mean? It's not a thing. <laughs> it's really not a thing. There's so much more to us than just our, our gender, right? Our gender identity yeah. is just a tiny little sliver of the pie. I'm a bike rider, I'm a singer, I am an author, I'm a speaker, I'm a Maddie, which is a mom daddy, I'm a husband to my wife, you know, like I'm all, I'm a sibling, like I'm all these things and my gender identity is like this big a slice of who I am. Yeah. And if that's what you're going to focus on in the workplace, then yeah, you're probably going to miss out on the rest of me. Um, and so if we can push through that, just, if you just like make it not a thing like it's just i just just and all what's happening is you're training yourself just like learning to you know ride a bike or loot you know do something physical or play an instrument anything you've ever done that's new is going to feel awkward at first yeah. i promise it doesn't take very long if you just keep flexing your muscle at it to create that neural pattern where i can flip around pronouns if i meet somebody who goes by a different pronoun than they appear it doesn't take but a minute once i say you know my pronouns are they them and they say my pronouns are he she or you know that it doesn't take me a time to flip that around i've been practicing for a while um but it, it once you practice i've had friends that are practicing and they're really great at it and so i promise it doesn't take very long um it just does take a willingness to be in the conversation 
you you hit a really good point you know for the person who does identify as a they you know as, as they see even i'm messing up here but you know it's up to them to also not be confrontational when right. someone misidentifies them right Absolutely. because especially in the workplace and that's not in the that, workplace that, we aren't gonna that that's not that doesn't work right so I do everything I can to have people um, give up right, wrong, good, and bad, and come from what works and what doesn't work. Sure. And it doesn't work to so get confrontational. Um, and it, it is a micro. It does occur as a microaggression. Like I said to the younger generation, they, that occurs as a microaggression to them. And I think that that's where we have to have. And that's where I think it's if if you've got a good coach or a good consultant, you've got some good trainers to help people have this conversation. And to bring people who identify as they them in uh, and trans men and women, you know, when it comes to trans men, we're easy. Once we go on testosterone and have our breasts removed, you can't tell. You People always say, well, I could tell. You can't. <laughs> They're so silly. <laughs> you can't tell. Um, and some trans women who uh, may have transitioned later in life, especially, may still have some of their secondary male characteristics that have a less easy time to pass and for some reason and part of it is that that's misogyny and that's a whole other conversation but it makes people very uncomfortable right and so you know you if companies will bring us in right and have us be with them and so that people see that we don't have horns and that we're just like everybody else and you know we just want to be treated with respect and right. then and then again you're right it's on the us to like let people learn right that's i've yeah. always been in that conversation like my commitment is to love the transphobia out of human beings and to share myself in a way that has you know me so that then you can say you know somebody right back in the day right. it was you know a lesbian <laughs> i used to say right. well now you know a lesbian um but now you know now you know a non-binary person right and once sure. you get to know me it's a lot easier to say jay they you know, right? They because you it just becomes easier because I now I'm known, and I think that is one of the big keys in companies that we have to get is that we have to get employees to be known by the other. Yeah, I think you know what I'm hearing overall is it's you're learning. We all are learning a new language, absolutely, and we're taking our base language and we're modifying it for the for the times. You know, yeah. for this yeah. evolution in our culture. Yeah, and. You know that goes cross borders and cultures across the world. I mean, it's going to be a long journey for you know people who speak French to incorporate it into theirs because they have the whole feminine masculine right. articles. Spanish is the same thing. Yeah, yeah. You know, exactly. so it's it's going to get pretty complicated uh, you know, as it goes. But at least if people have the framing of this is a new language. If in like anything with practice, it gets comfortable and it will be part of the norm. And I think the the you know another area that people have have struggled with is just in the context of languages. They means plural. Mm -hmm. He, him, she, her mean singular. Right. And so they're, they're trying to draw you know like. My brain so, is wired that they means there's multiple people here. You're not right. a multiple personality, but I right. only see one person. So the brain's not wired that way. Right. So when and, somebody leaves their jacket behind, what do you say? What, I'm sorry, I missed that. So somebody left the jacket in the meeting and you find it. What do you say? Whose jacket is this? Or no. somebody left somebody their, left, left their, their jacket. jacket. Their jacket. You say their jacket. Which is a one singular, correct? <laughs> right. So we've been using the singular they forever. <laughs> people uh, now, some people are frustrated by this, but most people don't say, "Hey, who left his or her jacket?" <laughs> Nobody's doing that. That's <laughs> right? a great point. Yeah. We have been using the singular they for an eternity, <laughs> and yeah. and now all of a sudden, well, it's grammatically incorrect. Well, it, it, <laughs> so the singular they has been out there. Uh, the dictionary's already incorporated it into our, uh, you know, it's already in our lexicon, right? It's already happening. Um, so it's already out there. And, you know, I, if you want to think of me as two people, I don't have a problem with that. One of the things that we educate on is the, we're starting to use the 2S instead of the, the 2S LGBTQIA. And 2S stands for two-spirited. 
which I don't identify as a two-spirited human because I'm not an indigenous person, and that would be culture stealing. But people who are indigenous people have had two-spirited people in their tribes, again, for an eternity. Okay. So these are people, <clears throat> these are people who have been born in their tribes and accepted, and they identify as two-spirited, which means they have the spirit of both male and female. Right. And I love that. I think that's beautiful. Again, not going to steal it. I'm too white for that. However, if you want to think of me as two people, I don't care. <laughs> Whatever works for you, right? Yeah. Whatever works for you. The other thing that, um, you know, because we could get into a whole long conversation about this and we don't have time, but, you know, 1.7% of the population is born intersex. Mm -hmm. Now, that seems like maybe a small number of people, but the, the exact same number of people who have red hair. Wow. Right. How many gingers do you know? Quite a few, right? Yeah. yeah. Same amount of people are born intersex. Now, intersex people have over 30 different variations on either their chromosomal expression or genital expression. So the way it works in some states now, thank you, California, who has banned surgeries on intersex babies. But the way it works is you cut them up and you put them in a box. And, they, and the doctor makes a decision with the parents or just makes a decision. Based on a ruler. Right. I'm not kidding about that. It's based yeah. on a room. And so the trauma that these people experience later when they have come aware of these surgeries and the, the way the body was, it's been horrible. I've, I've had clients that have just been through horrible, horrible experiences. Sometimes these surgeries leave them with an inability to feel sexual pleasure. Like there are so many things that these things do to people that is horrible right horrible. and should not be tolerated and so already you have this god made human that is born with maybe both ovaries and testes who knows but some mm -hmm. form of, diff of variation right sure. of an intersex human so that person's a they when in terms of their 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 like sex like their genital their, right their, genital. their genital expression of their <laughs> right. sexuality right. yeah but their gender they may grow up and decide that they're all male or all female or all boy or all girl you know what i mean that still doesn't have anything to do with that but my point is we have to make room for these people so that we can't stop cutting them up and putting them in a box yes right so this wave has got to come if we're going to be a nation or a world that includes all people that God made. Right? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, that's just how it is. And so, um, you know, I don't have any control over intersex people. Neither do you. Nobody does. Nobody and yet does. they keep coming. They're 1.7% of the population. So if there's not a they, where do they belong? Absolutely. I, I think this has been an absolutely enlightening dialogue and thank you no, so much. Long thing, what you go, but there's a lot to say, Carl. I <laughs> uh, know. I'm sure we could talk for another hour. Um, I do have one final closing question, and this is final words for our HR leaders, you know, our clients and their employees who want to take the first step to being more inclusive in either their programs or their interactions with their gender non-conforming colleagues. So what would be your your final words or of advice? Well Speaking of just because of my experience working in companies, this has to come top down. So the first thing they have to do is get their CEO enrolled and get this to be a, a company wide initiative. This isn't like, unfortunately, you know, hopefully the HR director has the ear of the CEO, but there has to be, this has to come from top down. So, Absolutely. It, so you cannot have, you know, the lower level people trying to deal with this and then the top level CEOs misgendering people and not using they them pronouns. So um, everybody has to get on board <laughs> from day yes. one. But also I would read the books, do the work. There's so much out there. But the biggest thing I would recommend is get a mentor, you know, get help. Um, there's companies starting mentors programs all over the place. And um, it's just, you know, I just did a talk for the U.S. Federal Reserve in San Francisco that's created a mentor, mentor program uh, for trans, you, you know, to bring in trans employees. So, I mean, this is a big conversation and uh, finding a mentor, finding somebody who can help you with this dialogue and help you in a way that has you feel good about it. Right. That's what's important. There's no shaming here. We're not doing that. Right. That doesn't work. 
We want to really honor people, lift them up, and have them just get that this is just something new to learn. If that's all yeah. that's happening, right? All the other story about it is story. All that's happening is this is something new to learn. And the reality is it's a wave that's bigger than anybody ever thought it could be. I'm, as a queer person, completely mind blown as an elder gay now that there's 10-year-olds coming out. <laughs> oh. I'm sure you are too. You're like, what is happening? <laughs> right? Exactly. It's mind but it's coming is my point. You know, we know that now the 18 to 34 year olds, 25% of them identify as LGBTQIA. 13% of those identify as gender non-conforming. So we've got, you know, or non-binary. So, we, you know, that wave is coming and, you know, find a way that you can approach that, that feels good and that uh, has, has you get the education that you need and that you want, but that also feels good to you and is a great way to lead your company forward. Those are really, really great tips. And I, I like the point you made, you know, the, the LGBT community or, you know, just thinking back 50, 60 years ago, people who identify as gay and lesbian had to go through a similar transition oh. of acceptance, familiarity, yeah. conversation, inclusivity, and we're still on that journey. I'm a hundred percent. I mean, I, well. When I came out in 1985, we were called the, the school. I was a KU grad and uh, our group was called the Gay and Lesbian Services of Kansas. And then from there, we started including bisexual people. And, you know, it's just and our goal is to continue to expand. And I know that people get confused and weirded out sometimes about the alphabet soup, um, but it's about inclusion. Right. It's about expanding ourselves enough to include everyone. And so everyone belongs. And one of my favorite things about this Gen Z generation is they're a stand for that. Right? They're just they're just not going to leave people behind. So I love that. Fantastic. Well, again, thank you, Jay, for speaking to me today and educating us on this very, very important and timely topic. Uh, I'll look forward to hopefully having another conversation and continuing the dialogue at a future Absolutely. date. Yeah. And and in the meantime, uh, I, I'm going to recap that that book you mentioned called Belonging in the uh, in the workplace. Sounds like it would be a really great book as a first start for HR leaders to want to get their head around how to incorporate this into their programming. Absolutely. So, Have a so, great day. Okay. Yeah, well, thank you. Just thank you so much for having me. <laughs> thank you, Jay.